thanks for coming to the panel. Last day of advertising week. It's going to be a good one. This is uh, we're going to be talking about the power of disruptive brands and what makes a disruptive brand. And uh, before we get started, I'm going to introduce our amazing lineup of panelists. I'm going to do the bragging for them so they don't have to. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, so we're going to start with AK Goel on, the, on my far end here. She is the CEO and founder of Socialize. And Socialize is the Middle East's first specialist social agency. And she was named one of the top 25 innovators in Asia Pacific. Congratulations. And a woman to watch by Ad Age. And she leads Socialize as its CEO. And also, she's the vice president and regional lead for Middle East and India, for we are a social and plus company. So uh, great to have you, thanks AK. And uh, over here we have Elizabeth Luke, brand communications for Pinterest. She is a seasoned communication professional with a passion for telling stories about the influence that tech and advertising have on culture. She currently leads brand communications at Pinterest, where she manages public relations, communications efforts demonstrating Pinterest influence and impact as a platform for advertisers. Elizabeth Luke, and finally, we have James, James <coughs> Gregson, creative director from Lego. James is a senior creative leader within the Lego Group's internal creative agency, leading a team responsible for creating best-in-class digital content across all of Lego Group's own digital ecosystem. So here's James. All right, introductions out of the way. Let's get into it. I'm Jason Harris, uh, <laughs> co-founder and CEO of Mechanism. Thank you. All right, so we're going to hear from, uh, when we talk about disruptor brands, we're going to hear from the agency perspective, from a 90-year-old brand, and then a 14-year-old social media platform. So a lot of range of commentary that we're going to hear about. So when we think about what makes a brand a disruptive brand, uh, really, there's sort of a couple definitions when we think about it. Uh, it is found an innovative way of doing business in an existing sector, that's one definition, or it creates a new market, that's another definition, or somehow it shakes up the status quo. So those are sort of three definitions when we think about disruptive brands. Innovative way of doing business in an existing sector creates a new market, or it shakes up the status quo in some way. So my first question to these lovely panelists is, a lot of brands claim, claim to be the Uber of this or the Airbnb of this. They, they say that they're changing the status quo or disrupting their category. What do you think today in the marketplace we live in today makes a brand disruptive in your point of view? Whoever wants to go first on that one. Okay, I'll, I'll take this one. Uh, I think we're seeing a really interesting uh, cycle of disruption, right? Like before, uh, historically, the, the Ubers, the Airbnbs, those their brands were really uh, disrupted predominantly because of this, right? The supercomputer in your hand, right? That delivered uh, uh, the ability for uh, people to call Ubers and order food on, online and, uh, you know, that sort of adoption really uh, rise really quickly. I think we're on a new sort of cycle of disruption if you look at, uh, dare I say, blockchain or Web3, right? And uh, those technologies haven't quite landed in, in the world of, uh, on the brand side, really disrupting, but I think uh, as time will tell, there will be, right? So there's, there's, new, there's new brands out there that are solving different problems, right? So if you look at something like Flexport, which is uh, you know a supply chain brand that is disturbing uh, that that whole category, uh, highly unsexy stuff, but uh, still solving a much needed problem that's out in the marketplace. Yeah, as as a PR person, I would advise against ever saying you're the Uber of this or the Airbnb of that. It's just the antithesis of what it is to be a disruptor, and that seems like a disruptor in name only. The reality of being a disruptor brand is like an example like Web3. There is a lot of failure that happens and there are a few that have broken through well, the stripes of the world and the Netflixes and the Coinbases, 
to some extent, right, as they're on a journey of evolution, but breaking the mold is not easy. And so we have to be very careful with the way that we label ourselves as disruptors. There's also so many other ways to, to label yourself. You can be a challenger brand too, right? There is the Coke versus Pepsi or Nike versus Adidas. So, you know, if, if you want to take on the challenge of truly being a disruptor brand, then there's a lot that comes with it. And there are also massive policy teams, uh, people that are on the Hill lobbying and advocating for brands like Airbnb, Netflix, Uber, and all of those, because it is incredibly difficult to disrupt. So uh, heed carefully if you're going to take on that ambition. definitely not easy to be a disruptive brand, but when I'm thinking about disruption, you know, a lot of the examples that you mentioned are actually business model disruptions, right? But when I think about disruptive brands, and especially with those of us who are in the room today, like disruption also happens from communication, language, and where we speak to our consumers, how we speak to consumers. But I think one thing that stands true for all disruption, no matter whether it's technology or product, is that it makes something better for the end consumer. And so it's really the consumer experience that is being disrupted. And I think that we live in an era now where it's experience disruption. And no matter what kind of company, we have to think about how we can engage with people differently. And yeah. so, AK, from an agency perspective, you did mention some brands are looking at it from a business disruption. Yes. And then when you work with brands from an agency perspective and you're trying to have them to be first to market or do emerging platforms or something new in technology, do you have do you find that easy conversation with brands, or are you dragging them into trying things out to be first to market? Well, like you know, like with any brand question to an agency, I will say that it's a combination, right? You have all sorts of brands, and I think one thing we've seen is that generally legacy brands older brands, and Lego can comment on this, tend to not have a test and learn mentality. So we're not working with marketeers who have access to innovation funds, or who have access to monthly, or who you know, sort of start monthly team meetings with agencies to come and share any idea they'd like to. Like all of this is brands that want to invest in innovation, or want to invest in R&D. It's great to work with those kind of brands that we don't always get to. Uh, but when we do come across marketeers that have an entrepreneurial mindset, then they're often the ones that get the first call. So working with brands and disruption is never easy unless it's a brand that adopts a test and learn mindset. And there are some brands like that, the one that the network that we're a part of, some of the other brands we work with. But the other downside is that oftentimes we rely on our technology to be the source of disruption. But that can often be a stunt that ends you know, once you quit, brought it to life. So it's something that you need to keep investing in and also make a part of the business. So like we've created world first stuff, like the world's first automotive bot, which led to more test drives from Mercedes Benz than anything else. But it ended in a month because we didn't invest in it and scale it and grow it. So can't over allow technology. And then uh, we're talking, James is from Lego. And we mentioned it's a 90-year-old brand, very well established, one of the great brands in the world. How do you think at Lego, in running the internal creative group, how do you think about disruption? And how do you get Lego into a challenger mindset uh, within the organization? That's a big question, uh, right? It's not lost to me that, as we said, I work at a 90-year heritage brand where uh, we're trying to fight disruptors mostly. Um, right and combat uh, disruption and, and stay uh, true to you know our core value proposition, which is a building product. Um, so I think we look at disruption in a number of different ways, uh, and uh, it, it's something close to what AK said in terms of uh, there's sort of disruption in where audiences are going, right, and the evolution of where audiences are spending their time, and that's definitely impacting uh, from a creative standpoint how, why, and when we reach them. Uh, but at the same time, right, uh, uh, I'll always look at uh, Nike from a creative inspiration standpoint because I think if you look at uh, on a scale of uh, creative provocation, right, being very safe and being very provocative, they are wonderfully provocative in all the wonderfully, totally accurate ways. And uh, 
from a creative standpoint, I'm very much trying to push us towards that in a still right for Lego, in a way that doesn't scare the crap out of every marketeer that I work with. That happens anyways. But, you know, that, that's the ambition. And when I think of uh, you, Elizabeth, you've been, you're a Pinterest, you've been at Twitter. When you think of disrupting in sort of the social media sphere, how do you think about disruption? And then also, one thing I wanted to ask sort of as a second question is, a lot of uh, platforms will see something become popular, like Be Real, and then they'll copy that because it's taking off and they'll add it to their platform. Just how do you think about disruption from the platform point of view, from your different experiences? Yeah, well, I want to start by asking, I'm going to take a leap here, how many people here use Twitter? If you could just raise your hand. Okay, cool. And how many people here use Pinterest? Awesome. Okay, good. People raise their hands. Even. I say that's <laughs> even. Yeah, it's actually about even, which is nice yeah. to see. But if you think about the way that you feel on Twitter, it's the world square. You're on the roller coaster for the world of highs and the lows, and you're hearing opinions from you know world leaders and celebrities and other people that you know that might be in small sub-communities, like people who want to tweet about plants and things like that. And so that is a very different use case than how you might feel on Pinterest. It's actually the opposite of being at the epi epicenter of the internet. It's creating your own world where you can say, hey, like, do I want to make a closet in my office? Let me see what that might look like. What is the step-by-step? -step? How am I going to research and plan my life so that I can actually take it offline and create a life I love. So a lot of people look at Pinterest as social media, but it's more like personal media and it's actually a visual search recommendations engine. So they're actually quite different. And so being a disruptor is not necessarily keeling to the virality of a Be Real or a TikTok or some of the other platforms out there, um, which can seem very compelling at first, but those of you who might be following certain very large um, platforms that then copy people, if you see the success metrics down the line, they're not doing very well with their copycatting. And so I think that there is a balance in disruption between understanding your end user and consumer behavior and a shift towards video and then also just copying someone else. So an example of that is at Pinterest, we recognize that people want to shop. They want to see what's on Pinterest and then buy it on platform. So one thing that we did to lean into this, and we were the first, is AR try-on for lipstick and eyeshadow where you can open up your camera, look at yourself, and through AR, be able to see yourself and you know, put on different makeup products because there's a massive number of beauty searchers on Pinterest. And one thing that we did that you won't see elsewhere is there are no filters on our cameras. You can't change the way you look, you can't change your face, because that's not our value orientation and it's not inspirational. So I think that there is a difference between evolution and copycatting, and I would argue that um, Pinterest is really focusing on evolving with the end user in mind. But if anybody wants to argue, not during the panel, you can just come talk to me at the end. Please argue with Elizabeth. I, I love that, I love that about Pinterest, right? Because, well, first of all, the your latest brand campaign, right, really stays true with that ambition. Uh, and I'm not being paid to say this. Uh, <laughs> but I also think, uh, you know, where where Pinterest really originally lived was like being the one uh, corner of the social web that was a healthy place to be. Positive corner of the Yes, end. there you go. Uh, and that for me is, yeah. <laughs> that for me is an, an element of uh, disruption, right? Because it goes in the complete face of what, where the social web has evolved and where all these other social products have and with, on my test of disruption, you know, when I say disruption is about changing, reshaping the customer habit, changing the customer experience, Pinterest has changed how we collect photos for our biggest events in our life and so much of it. So it's definitely in the end disruption. And, and when, for anyone uh, up here, when you think about uh, emerging trends, new technology, cryptocurrency, NFT, whatever it might be, how do you determine, is it like, scientific data research, how do you determine what you're going to pursue and what you're not going to pursue? How do you know what is going to stick around and what's going to be a flash in the pan and how to get involved either for brands you work with or for your brands? How do you kind of make that determination? So this is 
a really general point, but I often say to my team that if it if it scares you, it's probably going to last. And I felt that that way about Web three and you know cryptocurrency, blockchain, NFTs when it first came on in 2020, it moved so quickly. And I looked at that and it was scary because I thought this could spark up fundamentally change the world. And then how do we as marketeers, you know, whether it's agency side, brand side, how do we keep up with some of this? I felt blockchain, Web3 is really a space to lean into. And I'll probably talk about this, you know, a little bit later, but looking at that space, thinking it's scary, one thing is for sure is that the best marketeers are cultural sevens and they know that you have to participate in the communities that you wish to impact. And this is so true in Web3, where you have all these different subcultures and a new language and new tools. I really think that as marketeers, if we don't get into those new worlds and platforms and play with them a little, then we're not going to be able to have the impact on that customer. There's a new customer type now, people with wallets, and I think we need to have that impact. And this is why, you know, Plus Company, and I'll talk about that a little bit, we created an experience so that we can onboard people onto this experience. But I'll come back to that and, you know, let people yeah, you know, talk about, about it now, you know, time's running out, you really get it in. Well, I just, you know, we, so what we did with, we've got 3,000 people across our network and we created this NFT program where everyone gets an NFT and whenever they connect with someone else in the network, the NFT automatically evolves and collects points that give vacation and the results are fantastic. We onboarded so many people onto Web3, they learned about the space and now they feel differently about some of the technologies that they're interacting with. We've created a similar experience at Advertising Week where the official connections partner, when you walk out, you may scan, get an NFT, and everyone you connect with, your NFT evolves, you got all the connection data stored in there. And that's something we did a few months back, and it's been amazing to see that interaction. And I think as marketeers, if you all go in and play with some of these tools, disruption is, um, well, disruption becomes easier when you're truly engaging. Yeah, when I first hear that question, my first inclination is throw out the trends and yeah. look at your values. But I, I actually think it's important to understand the trends and look at it through that lens. And maybe it's a Venn diagram of what do consumers want? What's your superpower and how can you deliver for that? So I think you know one example for Pinterest is we're a visual search technology, as I said before. And the the value, aka trend, that is really important is inclusivity and representation. We saw that people have to type in terms like black before uh, they're looking for a hairstyle or looking for you know, an aesthetic or a makeup look, and we realized that we can fix that. So uh, we, there, are, I, there are six, there have been six billion boards created and 300 million pins created. So there's, on our own, a huge universe of data to look at and understand our consumer. And so we created um, a few technologies. One is skin tone ranges and the other is hair pattern, which is first of its kind, where somebody can just search braid and then look at six different hair patterns and find a hair pattern that's similar to theirs. Because at the end of the day, when you're looking on a platform like Pinterest in particular, I can't speak for the others, but it's, you want to see yourself in the pins that you're looking at and the life that you're creating, right? And so it is extremely empowering for marginalized voices to be able to see themselves in the platforms that they're using. And so one could call that a trend, another could call that a value, but that has been a defining point for us to really create a space that is unique to us and really serves our, our consumer and community. So are you, and maybe for Lego, that's something to, to think about, but do you, do you think about, okay, these are our values, this is what we stand for as a company, these are trends that we're seeing, is there, can we play in these trends or not? Do, like how strategic is it versus uh, this is taking off, we gotta jump on board? Yeah, well, you know, I think Particularly, and this is not a social justice panel, but we are getting towards a society where people expect brands to speak up and people are buying based on their values, especially with Gen Z more so. And so brands that want to be able to build up loyal consumers have to keep up. And that in and of itself is a form of disruption, right? And so for us, absolutely, we had to do an exercise when we said, what are our values? and what are we going to let go? Because we cannot afford to just 
you know, support every social issue that pops up as it pops up and scramble to support it. So how can we, again, instead of, you know, reeling at different trends or what competitors are doing, really create a steadfast center of gravity internally so that we know how to react to things in ways that are true to us and to our users. Does Lego have a filter like that as well? Or? Big time. Okay. <laughs> I, you know, I'd like exactly. to say that, uh, you know, there, there's uh, years of people, decades of people bought before me that uh, built uh, the Lego brand and the, the, the brand framework we have, the values we have with the brand uh, before I joined, um, right? And uh, we're on the opposite side of the spectrum, right? We are not about uh, breaking a trend and being the first to do something. We are a lot more cautious. Uh, and uh, there is a, a lot of talking that goes on before we jump in to a new category or a new segment. Um, and it's very traditional to you know, the manufacturing background that we have. Yeah, you're physical, and you do a lot now in digital as well, but you're sort of, you start as a physical product. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, disruption for the most part, right, uh, is very much predicated on uh, the digital space, right? And we are a physical building product, it's like a tangible thing. Um, but at the same time, uh, and that is our key value proposition, right? It's a building block. Um, but at the same time, audiences, the world is becoming more and more digital. Uh, kids are spending more and more time in, in digital uh, places and we have to uh, you know, figure out what is the right way for us as a brand that is a building block to live in that digital world. Uh, all right, we have two more questions. Uh, second to last question is, you guys are experts. What advice do you have for people in the audience, whether they work at a brand or a service company, wherever they might work, what advice have you guys learned in terms of helping to build a disruptive brand that you can pass on? So, I'm gonna, you know, I was to think about this and it was remind, I was reminded of the podcast that you recorded for Soul and Science with Jay Livingstone, who's the CMO of Starbucks. And, uh, so CMO of Shake Shack, sorry. And he mentioned something that the chairman often says, which and he said, the bigger you get as a brand, the smaller you need to act. And that really resonated with me because I think a lot of what I've been saying about having a test and learn mentality, whether you're a brand side or agency side, is really that the bigger brands get, the smaller they need to act. So my advice for brands would be to understand your consumer, be obsessed with culture, and then be bold in finding things. And if that means meeting the agency monthly to look at ideas, having innovation funds, you know, just really creating a culture where together with your partners, you're able to test and learn is something that I think is very important, especially uh, as technology moves very quickly. Yeah, I think I think that question has dramatically evolved to how I would have asked, answered it a year ago, right? Like uh, the world of TikTok has like, had such a massive impact on the, the length of a trend, right? And the lifespan of a trend uh, that I, I think I'd answer it far differently, far differently today as I would uh, a year ago, right? Where um, I think certainly for a brand like us, but even for uh, another brand, is uh, really knowing your values, understanding what uh, strategically makes sense for you as a brand, because uh, these trends are coming and going faster than you can believe it from a content standpoint or whatever it may be, uh, and you would be at the end of that, um, that peak far quicker than you see. I'm gonna take a little spin on this. But I feel like, yes, we can work at, at disruptive brands or not, or challenger brands or legacy brands. But the reality is, if you wanna be disruptive, you can be. You can just be a disruptive person in a good way. And you know, I get bored easily. So for me, I have the work that I do on a day-to-day -day basis, but there's always a tiger team of us trying to break the mold and really get out the notions that we're passionate about. So. You know, one thing my team did was called Pinterest Havens, and I'm so proud of that work, and that work was difficult and disruptive and took two years to make happen, but, you know, whether you're in a company that defines itself as disruptive or not, there is always room for disruptive ideas, even if they're at a smaller scale, and when you're really keeping service to other people in mind, it's extremely fulfilling and might have lasting impact. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good, it's a really good call, right? Because I think uh, it's so easy to get bogged down in the day to day, right? Delivering on that day to day, and I, the big part that we have is we have a 70, 30, uh, uh, 70, 20, 10 rule, right? And that 10% is based on origination, 
disruption. Coming out your experimentation. Yes. Number of yeah. Budget, yeah. Yeah. So to make sure that like That's you're smart. keeping uh, that opportunity, right? Because to your point, yeah, the day to day can get boring from time to time. How can you create space for your teams to come up with proactive ideas and innovative ideas that break the mold? All right. Last question. We we're running out of time, so we're going to make it. We're going to. I'm going to have you answer it and then give me one sentence on it. Your best in class uh, disruptor brand. Go. And why? Real quick. Go. Okay, so this is a really tough one. I want to add to something that Elizabeth said. The reason it's so hard to think of disruptive brands is often, I'll say as an agency, we come across disruptive marketeers, and that makes a huge difference into the disruptive work that we can do. Having said that, to answer the question, I do think of Nike recently as more of a disruptive brand because I thought their acquisition of the digital collectives and 3D studio artifact for $100 million was a big, bold move. And through the NFTs that they've sold later, they've had made 185. It's just, I imagine, how difficult it must have been to make so that decision. And I think any brand who is really leaning into new technologies Man, they should get the label of disruptor. All right, Nike. Uh, Wikipedia. How about that for an old school answer? Good. Good. Uh, you know, because I think uh, Wikipedia somehow broke an establishment of like print truth, and then all of a sudden established soft truth in the way that Wikipedia came to life. So I think Wikipedia is a, a fun answer to that. Nike, Wikipedia. Yeah. I'm going to give it to Impossible Foods. Oh. They went after a market of meat that's not meat by merchandising themselves as tasting like real meat and trying to appeal to larger audiences to not just you know feed vegans but all people and reduce greenhouse gas emissions they're now at a 1.5 billion dollar valuation in over 30,000 restaurants um, and stores around the world i think that's pretty disruptive and successful and disruptive all right well i want to thank elizabeth from pinterest james from lego and AK for social and thanks for coming to the panel I appreciate it.